Good morning and welcome to Glebe Chapel Online. My name is Angie and um, due to my poor memory, I'm going to jump straight in with the notices today. So what have we got in our service today? Well, we've got a kid slot by Jen, no doubt assisted by Mia. I love it when Mia joins in. Um, Paul Jones will be leading our prayers today. Um, and our talk will be given by Phil Davis, who has been our guest speaker for our online fellowship uh, weekend. It's the first Sunday in the month, and that's always set aside to wish those people with a birthday in March a very happy birthday. I will spare you by not singing to you, but I do pray that God will bless all of you who have a birthday in March. And we do thank God for you all. Now, Lois has asked me to remind you about the photographs for Mother's Day. I believe the idea is you take a picture of you and your mum and send it to Lois and so that that can become part of our Mothering Sunday service. And also um, a reminder that tonight at 6.30, it'll be the last um, part on Zoom of our fellowship weekend. So don't forget those things. Interesting word fellowship, don't you think? What does it mean? Now in my former life, when I was a teacher, uh, I would usually explain it like this to the children. So fellowship, it's made up of two words, right? Fellow and ship. So surely it's got to mean something to do with fellows in a ship. Okay, so who are fellows in a ship? Well, you've got your captain. Captain, the one who is in charge. Then you've got your first mate and you've got your second mate. They're like deputies. Um, then you've got, and I had to look this up online, uh, the bosun. Uh, in layman's terms, he's the maintenance man and he makes sure that everything on deck is working properly. He looks after the rigging and the sails if there are any checking that everything is working absolutely perfectly, a very important person. Then we have the engineers, the chief engineer and the second in command, obviously a very, very important job to make sure that the engine is running properly. And then we've got, who else have we got? Oh yeah, we've got uh, the medical person. If somebody gets sick, they can't really go after the surgery when they're in the middle of the ocean. And of course, I think the most important person is the cook because everybody needs feeding. And then of course you have your regular sailors. Everybody on this ship has a part to play. Everyone are very important in order that there is smooth sailing of the ship. But what if something goes wrong? What if there's a fire, a serious fire in the kitchen and the cook just can't handle it by himself? What if the captain said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not helping you. I'm the captain, that's not my job to put out fires. Or what if the engineer says, well, unless it, unless it affects the engine, you know, you deal with it, it's not my job. And what if, what if the, the, the sailor said, ah, oh, no, you deal with it, I'm busy. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? Because you see, the idea of fellowship, fellows in a ship, is that we all work together. And so that's what everyone would have to do in order to put the fire out. Everybody would forget about what roles they normally do, perhaps have to humble themselves and pitch in and help put out the fire. Because that was, that's what fellowship is, everybody working together. And church fellowship is like that too. We're a team. We're fellows in a ship, all working together. Each of us with different gifts, but all with the same aim um, in order to, to show God's love to everyone around us, including ourselves and people outside as well. Sometimes, of course, we get it wrong, and, and that's sad. But by the grace that God has shown us, we therefore have to show that same grace to everybody else. And hopefully then, things will be plain sailing. You know, the Bible speaks about fellowship too. But it doesn't speak about a ship, it speaks about a body. And as our call to worship today, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 12, verses 14 to 26. Listen to this. 
Now the body is made up of one part, not of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And I said in the beginning, we have um, been enjoying, well, we will have by the time you watch this, a fellowship weekend. And we're very aware that, that some of our church members are not able to um, access the internet or, or find Zoom a little bit difficult. But I think we want to say this morning that you are no less part of the fellowship. And I hope you've really enjoyed the, the little parcels that we've been able to bring you just to say you are still part of the fellowship and we love you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much this morning for putting us in families, especially, Lord, the, your family, which is worldwide. We thank you for our brothers and sisters all over the world. And in our own fellowship at Glebe, we recognise that everyone has different gifts according to what you've given us. And we thank you for that. And we do pray, Lord, that you will help us work together as a team. Thank you so much for the people who have worked so hard uh, with technology to make sure that we can, in a very strange way, meet together on a Sunday morning or a Thursday morning or a Sunday evening. We thank you so much for them. And we pray too, Lord, for people who have not been able to, to meet on the computer. Father, we pray for them especially, that they would be very aware of your presence um, and still feel that they are a vital part of the Fellowship of Glebe. And for those, Father, now, um, uh, as we meet together this morning, uh, we pray that your presence would be with us. We pray a blessing on all those who, wa who watch this service. And we thank you so much for the privilege of prayer. We thank you for who you are. And we thank you once again for being part of your great family. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi guys, so if you just grab your words and let's sing together, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me.
Everybody, welcome to today's kids slot. I'm Jenny and this is Mia. Today we're going to talk about going back to school and I know that most of you, if not all of you, are going back to school tomorrow on Monday. So are you going back to school tomorrow? 
Yes. Yeah, and how do you feel about that? Do you feel excited or worried? A little bit of worried because when you go back to school, it's your first time and some of you, you might be scared at school, but um, it's okay because your teachers will look after you. Yes, yes. So we're going to th think about how you can make yourself feel better or who can make you feel better. So what things could we do to make going back to school easier? So you could plan something exciting to do at the weekends with your mummy and your daddy. You could, after each, each day, after you've been to school each day, you could talk to your mummy and daddy about the most exciting things that you've done that day or the silliest things that you've done that day. But God tells us in the Bible to tell him about your day. So as well as telling your mummy and your daddy, tell God about what you've done that day as well and tell him about your worries because he cares for us. Now we're going to do a little bit of an experiment to show you. Um, so, right, I've got this bag here, a school bag, one of Mia's school bags, and I'm going to put it on Mia. So turn around. She doesn't know what we're going to do. Oh, how does that feel, Mia? Hard. Hard? Is it really heavy? Yes. Yeah, do you think we should take it off? Do you think you'd be able to walk very far in that? No. No, let's take it off then. Let's have a look and see what's inside. So let's open it up. Now really, in your school bag, you only need what you absolutely need for school. So do you think you need your water bottle for school? Yeah, yeah, so we'll need that. What could be so heavy in here? What else is in here? Oh, what's this? Pencil case with your pens and pencils. You need that, don't you, for school? So we'll keep that. Oh, what's this? Oh, that's really heavy. Oh, it's got some writing on there. What does that say? Worry about being around lots of people. Do you think that's something you're taking to school with you, that you're worried about being around lots of people after being around not very many people for such a long time? That's, I don't think we need that, do we? But that's something we worry about. Worried about difficult schoolwork. Are you worried about the, that the schoolwork will be really difficult? We'll leave that there. How about being nervous about having no friends? Do you think maybe your friends won't want to play with you or something like that? Is that something you worry about? What's this one? One more. Are you anxious about being away from your home and family? Is that something you worried about as well tomorrow at school? Well, we're going to keep all of those things out. And we're going to say, and we're going to show you a video now about some birds and some flowers. Can you see that bird eating the, sea, the nuts? Doesn't look very worried to me. Does but look, look closely. Yeah. And this beautiful daffodil. Got no worries, no cares in the world. No stresses. It looks absolutely stunning. And these crocus, they're coming up even though it's a really cold day. They're still flowering because they know that they've got everything they need to survive and to keep going. So you could see in those videos, the, the birds, they had no worries at all. They didn't, they didn't worry about where they were going next, what tomorrow might bring. And those flowers, they just completely look stress free. And what does the Bible say about that? In Matthew 6, God says, look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down careless in the care of God and you count far more to him to God than birds okay God provides us with everything we need and he orders us not to worry he doesn't say please don't worry he says don't worry telling you don't worry about it he wants us to trust him it also says in 1 Peter so be content be happy with who you are God's strong hand is on you Live carefree before God. He is most careful with you. He only wants to look after you. Okay, so what we're going to do in this backpack that me is going to take to school, I think we should include the pencil case and we should include the water bottle because we need those things. But all those things that we're worried about, that you're worried about going to school, I'm not going to put them in the backpack. And do you know what we're going to do with those things? Nervous about having no friends, we're going to give that to God. 
anxious about being away from home and family we'll give that to god worried about being around lots of people i'm going to give that to god and worried about difficult schoolwork i'm going to give that to god too because he he wants to take that on he doesn't want you to so now mia stand up i'll we'll put that bag back on now that we've not got all those worries how does that feel nice nice do you think you could run really far now with that backpack Okay. You could get really far with that backpack, yeah? Yes. Yeah. So, in Philippians 4, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Pray to God. Let God know of your concerns. God orders us to not worry. God says to pray and tell him everything. Don't forget to thank him for all the wonderful things he's done for you. So he lightens our load and we can run the race set before us much more easily when we've got a lighter load on our back. OK, I hope that's helped and I hope you have a fabulous first day back at school tomorrow, everybody, and back at work as well for you grown ups if you're going back. It was lovely seeing you all again. See you soon. Have a nice day at school. As a trustee at track, we love nothing better than to try out the equipment. Woo! We like nothing better than to drive each other round the bend. I hope you enjoyed that bit of fun that we just had out there. You probably didn't enjoy it as much as I did. It was great. <laughs> but I don't know if you noticed, there's a seriousness about what we just done. You see, nobody else was there. It was just me. And that's sad because this place has about 3,000 people each year that come through these doors. And our emphasis here at Track is to provide a safe, fun environment so that young people and people alike can be on the right track towards Jesus, knowing Jesus in their lives. We're going to pray about ministry work at the Glee, and it's not just about track. I don't know if you realise, but uh, there are many different ministry uh, organisations that Glee are connected with. And here's just a few of the Gideons, Brass Tacks, Counties, Christians Against Poverty, the Christian Tent Mission at the Three County Show, Echoes, and I'm sure that there are many others if we put our minds to it and think. You see, all of those ministry organisations have been affected over this last year. We found it difficult to do what we normally do in proclaiming about Jesus. But it's not all bad news, because over this last year, Bible sales have just skyrocketed. Some publishers have produced more Bibles than they've ever published before in just last year. You see, there's a need to know Jesus. So let's just pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are indeed a God of love and that your love for us is so great that you allowed your one and only son to come and take our punishment and die on a cross in our place, taking our sins and making us clean, all because of Jesus and your love for us. Lord, we pray that your will will be done here on earth that your life-giving word will continue to change lives all over this world. Lord, we pray for the many ministry outreaches that we have mentioned. These organisations that are adapting, they're changing in an ever-changing environment. Give them wisdom and help them to continue in reaching out, giving hope in a lost world. Lord, we pray that as you asked us to pray in Luke 10, the harvest is great, 
but the workers are few. We pray that you will send more workers out into your fields. Lord, we pray that you will empower us to live and speak for you. Give us opportunities to share the love of Jesus to the people that we meet. We pray for those people that are seeking you, that they too will find you. We pray all this in the name of our loving Lord Jesus. Amen. The reading today is taken from Mark chapter 11. I'm reading from the New Living Translation and starting at verse 1, Jesus' triumphant entry. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go to that village over there, he told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one else has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street tied outside the front door. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? They said that Jesus, what Jesus had told them to say and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the centre of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming of the kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest heaven. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple. After looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the twelve disciples. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the whole with forever 
be the fire in my heart be the wind in these sails be the reason that I live Jesus Jesus Be my guide, Jesus. Be the fire in my heart. Be the wind in these sails. Be the reason that I We continue reading at verse 12. The next morning, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off, so he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves, because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, May no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people, buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, The scriptures declare, My temple will be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed of his teaching. That evening, Jesus and the disciples left the city. The next morning, as they passed by the fig tree he had cursed, the disciples noticed it and it had withered from the roots up. Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith in God, I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen, and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you receive it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against, so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Let's just pray for Phil. Father, we just pray for Phil now as he opens and expands your word to us. May we just be able to learn from it, put into practice, and be blessed. And we pray that you'll bless him too. Amen. 
Good morning and hello again. It's been great being with you throughout this weekend. I'm saying that on Thursday as I record this for Sunday, but I'm hoping in advance to we've had a great time this weekend. Um, I don't know when was the last time you were really surprised. Um, maybe it's someone when you're away from home and you're on holiday, a long way from home, and you meet someone or you come home and there's a parcel of cakes on your doorstep or maybe you've watched a film and then you turn to whoever you're watching it with and say at the end wow I didn't expect that end something totally unexpected something outside the box unexpected or oh, that phrase I never expected that the unexpected of course sometimes can bring joy and pleasure but sometimes it can disconcert us or sometimes it causes real issues or problems or causes us to rethink our lives Mark I almost said Matthew there. Ma we're in Matthew and Dunvin. So Mark chapter 11 is such a chapter. And we're going to see at least three times where Jesus does something that causes people to gape or, or scratch their heads. In Mark chapter 6, we have a day that is written in Mark's gospel with so much detail in the life of Jesus that documents the day starting at six o'clock in the morning right through to six o'clock the next morning. It includes Jesus feeding the 5,000, him walking on the water. But now in chapter 11, uh, we start probably one of the most detailed, written, detailed uh, weeks in the life of Jesus, what we call Passion Week. Jesus has been staying the weekend in Bethany, just two miles outside the walls of Jerusalem to the east. Um, he's been staying with his friends, uh, his dear friends, Lazarus, Martha and Mary. And Mark 11 uh, covers, if you like, Monday to Wednesday of that Passion Week. There is a, a real energy in Mark's gospel, as you've noticed, isn't there? You know, that sense of at once, straight away. And you can so easily whip through these stories and miss what Mark and God's Spirit are trying to portray. Remember that first part of Mark's gospel, chapter 1 to 8, is really trying us to, to think through the identity of the king. Who is Jesus? And now in the second part of the gospel, in, in chapter 9 to 16, we're thinking about the purpose, his purpose for coming to die on that cross and come back to life again. And Jesus has come up the road from the Jordan Valley uh, in this final journey to Jerusalem through Jericho. And, and Jesus then predicts the third time that he's going to die and rise again. But as so often with us now, the words of Jesus for his disciples go in one year and out the other. Uh, Maybe he's telling us another parable, but this is the third time they've heard it. But in the next three days, the next few days, Mark recounts three unusual, unexpected incidents that build up this crescendo, building to the, the whole question of why Jesus has come. The first is on Monday morning, although we celebrate very often on Palm Sunday, it could quite possibly have been the Monday of that week. But on that Monday of the week, they, they leave Bethany, where they've been staying. Jesus sends two of his disciples ahead to a little village called Bethpage to get a, a colt, uh, the foal of a donkey. Now, Bethpage is about a, a, a mile nearer Jerusalem than Bethany, on the top of the Mount of Olives, where Jesus will spend a fair bit of time over the next week. And those disciples go and they find that, that this colt, this foal of a donkey. Uh, and Jesus tells them, uh, untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you why you're doing it, say the Lord needs it and we'll send it back shortly. And it, it happens exactly as Jesus says, and they have that conversation. And they bring this, this coat, this full of a donkey back. And, and it says in the passage that they throw their coats of it over it. And, and, and Jesus sits down on that donkey. Others throw coats on the ground and others uh, take down uh, uh, branches from the trees, we're told in the other Gospels, uh, palm branches. And they come down the Mount of Olives singing and shouting, Hosanna, save, salvation, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Other accounts of call tell us of a conversation between the leaders of the nation about the children and disciples making too much noise, causing a disturbance of the peace. But Jesus 
enters Jerusalem and he goes to the temple and he looks around and because it's late he heads home with the 12 disciples back to Bethany. Now there are three unexpected things or unexpected things that we learn. Number one we see a king on a donkey. Number one a king on a donkey. When Jesus rides into Jerusalem people laud him and 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 put their coats on the floor on the ground and, and, and hail him as king notice verse 10 blessed is the coming kingdom of our father david hosanna in the highest heaven this type of parade was culturally appropriate in that era a king would ride in and be hailed by cheering crowds just like our own queen uh, during her jubilee uh, but when i saw the queen many years ago on the corner of a sea case in a little village called Gowerton in Swansea. She was not in a Fiat Panda. No, it was some kind of Rolls Royce or Bentley. You see, Jesus deliberately goes off script and does something very different and unexpected. He did not ride in, ride in to Jerusalem on the Rolls Royce of the time, a magnificent, powerful war horse. Rather, it was on a polos, a colt, of a small lowly donkey. Tim Keller puts it beautiful, beautifully. Uh, here was Jesus Christ, king of authoritative, miraculous power, riding into town on a steed fit for a child or a hobbit. What was Jesus doing? Oh, and he was letting them know that he was the one prophesied way back in the Old Testament by the prophecy of Zechariah he was the great Messiah that was to come this is what it says in in Zechariah at chapter 9 and verse 9 rejoice greatly daughter of Zion rejoice and shout daughter of Jerusalem see your king comes to you righteous and victorious lowly and riding on a donkey on a colt the foal of a donkey no wonder they shouted he who comes that's another name by the way for messiah he who comes and they watch this man riding on this donkey feet almost dragging on the floor no saddle just coats of peasant galileans I can imagine the disciples at the end of that day taking the donkey back to whoever owned it and saying, and the, and the owner saying, what did Jesus use it for? I mean, I could, I could have given him a horse, but he was the unexpected king and he didn't fit in and he doesn't fit into the world's categories of kingship. He brought majesty and yet meekness. There's an old song that sometimes we may have sung. It says, he walked where I walked. He stood where I stand. Born in lowliness into a questionable family. He never owned a home, barely had an, any clothes himself. Yet here he rode, or here rode the king of kings, unexpected in power and yet gentleness. Many years ago, there was a chorus I used to sing when I was growing up that used to go like this. He did not come to judge the world. He did not come to blame. He did not only come to seek, it was to save he came. And when we call him saviour, we call him by his name. When John has a vision of Jesus in Revelation, uh, we see this in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5 and 6. And it says that we're looking for someone who's worthy to open the scroll, this vision of heaven. And John weeps because no one's worthy. And one of the elders says, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and it's seven seals. And, and, and John turns and looks for this, this lion. And instead it says, he sends sees a lamb, looking at though it had been slain in the center of the throne. In Jesus, says Tim Keller, we find infinite majesty, yet complete humility. Perfect justice, yet boundless grace. Absolute sovereignty, yet utter su submission. All sufficiency in himself, yet trust and dependence on God. This is a king you can approach. 
approach him now as saving king for one day this world will face him as the judge a king on a donkey secondly a king in a temple a king in a temple see this is the second unexpected thing that happened that day it says that he on the Monday that Monday we're talking about when he rode into Jerusalem he arrives visits the temple because it's late he goes back to Bethany but he returns the next day and when he returns he's seen what's going on in the temple when he returns that next day he drives out, maybe it's the Tuesday, he drives out those buying and selling. He, he overturns the tables of the money changers because they had a, a temple money system to buy a lamb for the Passover. He stops the market. Now I want you to notice, and I'll put some pictures up for you to see this. I want you to notice the temple area. When you went into the temple area, the first place that you came to was the court, which was called the court of the Gentiles, court of the ethne. Get that word ethne, but we give the word ethnic or ethnicity. And it means nations, the court of the nations, the Gentiles. And it was the only part of the temple that non-Jews were allowed to go. It was the biggest part of the temple and you had to go through it to get into the rest of the temple. But in that court of the Gentiles, they set up a marketplace where the business of the temple went on. And crowds of people are buying and selling, changing money to get those special temple coins to, to buy those Passover lambs. Almost like a business scam, really. And many had travelled from all parts all over Israel and from the Ro known Roman world to be there. And so you can imagine the noise. Um, Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells of a Passover week one year where 255,000 lambs were bought and sold and sacrificed. Just imagine. Just the noise of the trading and the sheep and the people. And this was the place for non-Jews, for the ethne, for the Gentiles, for us. That place where they could, the only place that they could quiet their hearts and reflect and pray and find God. And Jesus turns it all upside down and he drives them out. And he quotes Isaiah the prophet, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. This place is for the Gentiles. And it says they were amazed. Why did it amaze them? Let me suggest a couple of things. Number one, why? Because it was popularly believed that the Messiah would come and purge the temple of foreigners. But instead, Jesus is purging the temple for the foreigners. He was taking the side of the Gentiles, the non-Jew, and he was acting as their advocate. Throughout this weekend, I've been encouraging you to buy and read good books. And here's another one. This is uh, Tim Keller's book on Mark's Gospel. Um, and it's called King's Cross. Really recommend it. And in it, he suggests something deeper and even more unexpected. You see, the story he suggests of the temple goes back to the Garden of Eden, to Genesis chapter 1 to 3. The place where in that garden God dwelt in paradise where no death, no sickness, no deformity, no evil, no imperfection could exist within God's presence. And in God's presence was shalom, wholeness, well-being, fulfilment, joy, flourishing. But paradise was lost when these first humans, Adam and Eve, decided to surrender and build their lives on other things or the word of others instead of God. And so they're banished from the garden and at the entrance to the garden was placed a flaming sword to bar them from getting back in. No one could get past that flaming sword into the presence of God. And we, through the millennia of ages, have joined in with this rebellion against God by our, our words, our, our lives, our action, our attitudes, our thoughts, and we've pushed God away from us. And there is a sword that stops us getting back to God, the sword of God's fairness and justice. And no one can survive the sword's blow as 
the Bible says all have sinned. So how do we get back into the presence of God? Well, you see, God provided in the Old Testament, we see this, God provided a provisional solution for his people. He gave them a tent, a tabernacle, as it was called, and then the temple, just like the one that Jesus stood right now in as he cleared it out. And in the furthest part of the temple, away from the court of Gentiles where Jesus was standing, was the place called the Holy of Holies. It was a small place with a, a thick curtain or veil to shield the people from God's presence. Because God's immediate presence was fatal uh, to human beings. But just once a year, on the day called the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, you may find that in your diaries or uh, as you look and search, the high priest could briefly go inside, but only if he carried a blood sacrifice, because there was no way into God's presence without going under the sword. But that was only for the Jewish people, only for the Israelites. So when Jesus quotes Isaiah 56 and verse 17, which goes like this, and foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to, to, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, for my house, he says, will be called a house of prayer for all nations. That Gentiles could get access to the presence of God. No wonder they were amazed. This was so unexpected. They'd missed the fact, you see, all the way through the Old Testament, that God had said through his prophets that the glory of the Lord or the glory of God would cover the earth. In other words, the whole earth would become a holy of holies. People of all races and backgrounds and social classes welcomed to the presence of God. Now, to get past that sword, Isaiah again prophesied that the Messiah would be cut off from the land of the living. It's that uh, a famous passage, Isaiah 53, led like a lamb to the slaughter, cut off. And John, remember, in that book called Revelation, uh, remembered uh, the slaughtered lamb, the lamb that looked that he had been slain. You see, that lamb, Jesus, the lamb of God that took away the sin of the world, that lamb went under the sword and it broke his body, but it broke itself. One author famously called death of death in the death of Christ. You see, Jesus took the sword for you and for me. That's why at the moment Jesus died, the veil or that curtain that stopped us getting into the Holy of Holies, so not humankind getting there, was ripped from the top to the bottom, it tells you in Mark 15 and verse 38. But that curtain wasn't just ruined, it was made obsolete, so now you and I may have access to the presence of God. The flaming sword claimed its victim and the veil parted and the way back to the garden the paradise of God was permanently open. I wonder if you remember the story of the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, where Aslan, representing Christ, takes the place of Edmund, one of the children who rebelled against Aslan and joined the White Witch. And Aslan was the willing victim in the ancient prophecy that was told to, to, the, to the witch. And Aslan willingly takes Edmund's place and willingly dies for Edmund on an ancient stone table. And then that stone table breaks and Aslan's alive. And C.S. Lewis was hinting at this great sacrifice of Christ. No more sacrifices. The stone table is broken. And for Lucy and Susan, that unexpected moment points us also, as it pointed them, to what would happen unexpectedly on Easter Sunday. The king on a donkey, the king in a temple, and thirdly, the king and a fig tree. Now there's a strange sounding story here. Don't miss it. Let me read it to you again. It says in verse 12, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, he says on his way in, you see, to go and clear the temple, uh, Jesus was hungry. Seen in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, it found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard him say it. And a little bit later on, in the next day, on the Tuesday, in the morning as they went along, verse 20, they saw it had withered. It had shriveled up and died. Unexpected. 
there's something deep going on here. You see, a Middle Eastern fig tree bore two kinds of fruit, small nodules and the fruits, or the figs I should say, we know and perhaps love. At spring, as the leaves came, before the figs that we eat came out, branches bore little nodules that were abundant and very good to eat. You could, you could pick them and eat them. And if you found a fig tree that had sprouted leaves but no delicious nodules, you knew that something was wrong, something was diseased, and that fig tree was dying on the inside. The growth of fruit without, sorry, the growth without fruit was a sign of decay. And Jesus was pronouncing that such in here. Remember, this is before, as I said, he comes in to clear out the temple. And he's using this fig tree to explain to his disciples, if you like, another parable or, or an object lesson. And it's an object lesson against the dead religiosity. The fig tree wasn't doing its job, just like Israel wasn't doing its job, claimed to be God's people, but didn't bear fruit for him. The temple courts were busy. A lot was happening, but not much praying and not much heart change. In many ways, COVID in this period has given us at the time to examine our hearts also. What is true life with God and what does it really show? Do we truly have a reborn heart and life? Is it bearing fruit that will give glory to God and also benefit others? Now, later that day, as I said, Jesus will clear the temple of his fruitless activities. I want more than busyness. I want character change. We've learned three unexpected lessons this morning. Firstly, a king who is gentle and lowly in heart. He says it in Matthew's Gospel, Come to me, I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Secondly, a king who is inclusive, who has taken the sword of God's justice so we can run into the arms of the Father, whoever we are, wherever we have been, whatever we've done, he can shape our hearts right now. And thirdly, a king who delves into our souls and is looking for that fruitfulness and that wholeness, and in particular, a heart that's willing to change. Many years ago, uh, in my late teens, Keith Green was a, a, a Christian singer and started a, a ministry called Things That Matter. He died aged uh, age 31 in, a, in, a, in a, a plane crash, but often things that he sang and said spoke into my life. He talked at one, one of his songs of a, a life that was dusty and in his song asked in a prayer to God to blow out the dust within and come and breathe your breath upon me. I want to mention some words of another song by him that are very similar. I want to make it our prayer as we close our time this morning. The song and the prayer goes like this. My eyes are dry. My faith is old. My heart is hot and my prayers are cold. But I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. Or what can be done for this hard heart like mine to soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you and your spirit of love. Please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. body bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the ancient seal by heavy stone Messiah still and all
Shall pierce the night.